Welcome everyone to another episode of True Crime Storytime. I'm your host, Jada. start off by saying thank you to everyone who's joining in on these podcasts with me. I have to tell you, um, like I said before, I really enjoy true crime. So to be able to share this with everyone, it's been a lot of fun doing the research for each episode. Today, we're going to be looking at the murder of 17-year-old Michelle Yvette Missy Avila. On February 8th, 1968, Missy grew up in Arletta, California, around the Los Angeles area in the San Fernando Valley. Around the age of eight, Missy and Karen Severson became neighbors and very close friends. The girls also became close friends with another girl who lived around the block from them, Laura Doyle. According to Missy's family, the girls did everything together. As the girls grew up, life changed, as that seems to happen. Karen became pregnant with a daughter around the age of 15. Missy continued to mature and was very pretty and popular, and this became a point of jealousy among Lauren and Karen. At least for sure, Karen was very jealous of Missy. As time passed, they spent less and less time together. Missy once got into a fight with a group of girls after some of them accused her of sleeping with their boyfriends. Later, Missy was told by another girl that this rumor had actually been started by Karen, and this upset Missy very deeply because she still considered Karen a friend and didn't think she would say anything like that about her. During her junior year in high school, Missy began dating a boy. After about a month, she broke off their relationship. Shortly after their breakup, Karen began seeing the same boy and they moved into an apartment together. Missy told her mother once about a time when the boy pulled her onto his lap right as Karen walked into the room. Missy had no intention of getting back together with him, and she had told him that she had no intention of getting back together with him. And according to Irene, Missy's mom, Missy had even told Karen she thought that they should, that Karen should break up with him. And this didn't help the situation between Missy and Karen. Uh, Karen was already jealous. Now Karen thought that the boy that she liked wanted Missy and not her. So this just, you know, kind of added fuel to the fire. Uh, Not long after that incident, Karen and Missy just pretty much fell out completely. Shortly before her death, Karen and Missy had actually gotten into a fight at a neighborhood park. And according to witnesses, Karen had pushed and slapped Missy and had even threatened her with a beer bottle. On October 2nd, 1985, Missy told her mom she was going to be going out with Laura. Her mother recalled the girls were laughing and talking about boys as they left. Missy was expected to return home that night. A few hours after the girls had left, Lauren called asking to speak to Missy. Concerned, Irene told her that she thought that they were together. Laura then told Irene that they had been, but she had left Missy talking with three boys in a blue Camaro while she had gone to get gas, and when she returned, the car, the boys, and Missy were all gone. Concerned, Irene called the police and reported her daughter missing. Three days after her daughter failed to return home, Hikers found her body in a creek in Angeles National Forest, around 30 miles from her home. Her hair had been cut off in chunks, her face and shoulders were bruised, and her body had been pinned down in the water by a large log on her neck. At this point, the police now turned their investigation from a missing persons case into a homicide case uh, and began going off of the lead that Laura had left Missy with three boys in a blue Camaro. Um, they did a lot of tracking and looking for the boys and the blue Camaro, but eventually came up empty handed. A while went by and Laura changed her story. She told Irene that there was never a blue Camaro or three boys and that she had actually dropped Missy off near an LA church to meet up with a drug dealer and deliver money. So with this change in story, now the police obviously switched their investigation from the fictional boys in the blue Camaro to now they're looking for this drug dealer and this church where Laura says she dropped her off. Well, still the case remained stagnant and it eventually went cold. Then in July of 1988, 
a friend of Karen's, Eva, told police that she'd actually been with Laura, Karen, and Missy the day that Missy had disappeared. Uh, I guess Laura had picked up Missy, and then Karen and Eva were following, unbeknownst to Missy, in another car following Laura, uh, following Laura and Missy. So she tells police she witnessed Laura and Karen yelling and fighting with Missy. She claims that when things turned violent, uh, she wanted no part and left and went back to the car and never actually saw what happened to Missy. After Ava came forward with her account of what happened the day that Missy went missing, Karen and Laura were arrested. And Missy's mom was absolutely heartbroken. She never would have guessed her daughter's best friends could have been involved in killing her. In fact, her daughter seemed hopeful that like they were going to be rekindling their friendship um, that had kind of, you know, fluttered out. Even the police didn't suspect Karen. According to the L.A. Deputy Sheriff Bill Patterson, who was quoted, we talked to Karen several times during the investigation, and not once, I mean, not once, did we suspect she was in on the murder. Karen had actually become very close to the family again after Missy's death. She moved into Irene's house with her daughter for a few months, though she does deny this. Um, she says that this was something cooked up by the prosecution, that she never actually lived there with her daughter. Um, but that she, you know, did spend a lot of time with the family after. She uh, was said to go and spend lots of times, uh, lots of time at Missy's grave, and mourn for her very deeply. And there were even reports that after Missy's death, Karen seemed to be haunted by her former best friend, um, and claimed to see apparitions and visions of her. In later interviews, Karen stated the reason that she became so involved with the family after Missy's death was out of obligation. She wanted to console the family for the part that she played in Missy's murder. Um, but she also said she wanted to know like, how the police investigation was going, who was suspected, and what evidence they found. Um, I mean, that to me screams a little psychopath. Um, you know, they they always talk about like people who... Um, insert themselves into the investigation that, you know, want to help, want to do all this stuff. And sometimes that makes like people that actually want to do that, it makes them look kind of bad. But then there are people like this who were involved and knew what happened and, you know, get some kind of sick pleasure, I guess, uh, whether it's like a sick pleasure or guilt or whatever it may be, but they involve themselves, um, in, you know, hunting for justice and trying to find who did it when really they're the ones who did it or they know who did do it. Um, so yeah, she, she says she felt this moral obligation to do so. Um, but then, you know, also, you know, had these ulterior motives to, to being so close to the family afterwards. So when the girls were brought to trial, they actually wound up pleading not guilty to first degree murder. Uh, the prosecution was going for first degree um, because, according to them, they they felt this whole thing was planned. They planned to lure Missy out there, and uh, they planned to kill her. Um, Eva did testify at the pretrial hearing uh, about what she had witnessed that day, though she was never charged in connection with the crime. Both Laura and Karen were convicted of second-degree murder, despite the prosecution trying for first degree. And this was due to several members of the jury just not being convinced that the murder had been planned. In March of 1990, both women were sentenced to 15 years to life in state prison, and at the time they were 22 years old. Two years after the murder, in prison, Karen admitted she was ashamed of what she had done, but insisted that she only meant to torment Missy, not kill her. She said, looking back, I was jealous of her. She also had said from jail, I know the details of what happened to Missy. Missy wasn't as innocent as everyone thinks when she moved in on my territory, meaning the boy she liked. I just couldn't take it anymore, but no matter what, I couldn't kill her. According to Karen, the three girls were going to confront Missy about the fact that they believed she had been sleeping with their boyfriends. An altercation ensued and things got physical. Missy's hair was cut by Laura and herself, which she thoroughly admits to. Um, she According to her, Missy was very proud of her looks, and they thought that that would be a good way to get back at her. She says that she turned to leave with Ava back to the car, 
and she heard Laura and Missy continuing to argue. One thing led to another. Uh, Laura was standing in the water, egging Missy on, and Karen wound up pushing Missy right into Laura's waiting hands. She claims she watched Laura push Missy into the water, but did not actually kill Missy herself. She also claims she was high on drugs and alcohol at the time. In December of 2011, at the age of 45, after serving 23 and a half years, Karen was released from prison. Since her release, she's written a book detailing the crime and what happened that day, and has called herself on more than one occasion, uh, on more than one occasion in more than one interview, uh, a bully. So she now uh, does talks about anti-bullying, and in an interview, she did state she was going to donate some of the proceeds from her book to an anti-bullying campaign. Missy's family became outraged when they found out about the book and that she was going to be profiting off the loss of Missy. They filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Karen and began pursuing legislation in the state assembly that was eventually called Missy's Law. The bill was written with the intention of helping family members of crime victims recoup money from a perpetrator who has profited from a book or a movie deal based on their crimes. In 2015, Missy's Law was signed by Governor Jerry Brown. Due to the First Amendment, the bill does not prevent criminals from telling their stories, but it can require companies who work with criminals to notify victims and their families about any projects. Karen goes around now speaking, like I said, about anti-bullying. She considers what happened that day to be bullying that went too far. And in one interview, she refers to bullies as pack animals, such as wolves. A single wolf will likely not do anything, but let the pack be together and they will attack. She feels like had they not confronted Missy as a group, the outcome would have likely been different. Um, I've watched now a couple interviews with Karen, and I strongly urge um, anybody who finds this story interesting, uh, just like with any of the stories that I tell you, I, I encourage people to, you know, look in to the stories themselves. But I have, uh, I've watched, you know, a couple interviews that she has done, and to me, and again, this, this is my personal belief, this is what I took from it, um, there seems to be a lot of victim blaming. I mean, she definitely does admit to being a bully. She admits um, that she was jealous. Um, but there doesn't seem to be, from her at least, a lot of remorse uh, or true remorse. Um, she cries and she says she's sorry, but there seems to be a lot of, I did this, but here's why. Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, there's remorse, but I just don't know if it's true remorse. Um, or maybe she feels bad, but she doesn't like feel as bad because she feels like maybe her, they were justified. I, I mean, I don't know. Um, that's why I say, you know, I encourage everybody to, Look into these things, uh, you know, if, if you want to on your own um, and, you know, kind of see what you take from it. But um, just some of the interviews I've seen of hers just doesn't um, doesn't scream totally remorseful, doesn't doesn't scream like she totally takes responsibility for what she did. Like I said, like, uh, you know, this happened. But here, let me tell you why it happened. So. She, like I said, now speaks about anti-bullying and about how terrible bullying is. And in December of 2011, at the age of 45, after serving 22 years, Laura was also released from prison. And it seems that after her release, Laura has kept a pretty low profile, unlike Karen. So that is the story of Missy Avila's murder, perpetrated by her so-called best friends, and it definitely begs the question, do we really know who we bring into our circle? It was great getting to hang with you guys today, and I look forward to next week when we get to do it again. Thanks.